Coming up next on the Jeff Crilly Show, you'll meet a controversial authority on Airbnbs. He's made more than $10 million on properties he doesn't even own. His incredible journey just ahead. Many are predicting that the worst is yet to come, which is unfortunate, said one person here. Until now, they've enjoyed the reputation of being the nation's icebox. Watched a burglar in his home this morning by webcam. As a journalist of over 25 years, stories are what make my world turn. Reporting live from the Dallas Newsroom tonight, Jeff Crilly, Fox 4 News. But in 2008, I took the jump from my familiar life and started a PR firm from my home. We're talking about anyone with a camcorder like the one I'm using becomes a television network. We started slowly growing the company and we now have over a hundred clients and we've branched into the world of live digital broadcasting. I now own eight different TV studios and have a huge team. And the stories that I now get to share are sometimes the most important of my life. Life has a funny way of coming around full circle. This is the Jeff Crilly Show. Well, I've known a lot of people who have been very successful in Airbnbs, but they actually own the property that they're managing. Uh, my next guest is uh, Sean Rakicic, and he is with Airbnb Automated, and he has figured out a very uh, proven formula to make a lot of money without put a, putting up a lot of risk. Sean, thanks for coming on the show. Yeah, thank you for having me. Absolutely. Excited to be here. Well, he has this gleam in his eye, and I can just tell when I first met him that firm handshake. I said, man, this is an entrepreneur's entrepreneur. How did you get into Airbnbs? Well, by, actually by accident. So I owned a newspaper media marketing company. I consulted for newspapers, Dallas Morning News, right here actually, building sales teams. And I had to put some sales guys into some apartments because sales guys are really um, narrow-minded, not, not narrow-minded, but maybe over-focused. And so what we did is we rented apartments for them to move to Houston so they wouldn't have to worry about paying rent, shopping for furniture. And when they moved out, we ended up, long story short, with three empty furnished apartments because we didn't need them the whole year we signed the leases for. Wow. So we put them on Airbnb just to not lose money on paying the rent. And because they were instantly profitable, we just kept them on. And that was 2014. Okay. Now, how did that morph into what you do today? So uh, after two years of letting them exist in the Airbnb space, just paying the rent, Houston announced that they're going to host the Super Bowl. And then all over the news, people were going to charge $1,000 a night for their places. So I had the bright idea to stop focusing only on newspapers and maybe pick up more properties. So I was leasing properties from a high rise called Sky House in Houston. And we picked up more at that property, picked up a few at a couple other properties. We had 10 when the Super Bowl hit and we made like 15,000 in net income that weekend. And that's when it hit. We were like, this is something that we could full sale commit to. So my newspaper consultancy then became an Airbnb arbitrage business. Wow, and you go around the country, you, uh, you hold seminars and you do speeches. Mm -hmm. talk, about, talk about that side of your life. Well, um, last month, I just spoke at an event. It was called STR Wealth Conference. It had about 2,500, mostly owners, a lot of people who own their properties or do what's called co-hosting, where you find an owner and operate the property for them as an Airbnb. And I spoke on something called revenue management. It's how you can maximize the income on the property. It's a very nerdy, numbers-driven topic. Awesome. Yeah. Okay, so more with Sean in a second. We found uh, one of his videos. Let's go ahead and roll that. I have made over $10 million in Airbnb, and I'm going to teach you how to do it in 30 seconds. Find a landlord with a house, offer to pay their rent in exchange to be able to do short-term rentals, sign a long lease, furnish it, put it on the market. Any regular city, nowhere special. Average nightly rate, $200 a night, weekends, weekdays combined. You'll need 50,000 nights to make $10 million, but we're going to make this faster. Take your profits from house number one, get house number two, number three, number four. You'll have a couple housekeepers build a team. If you can get up to 100 properties, you only need 500 nights booked to make your next $10 million. I did this business starting with $4,000, and I'll teach you how to. There's literally dozens and dozens of videos just like that. Sean, what's one of your favorite success stories? Um, if I had to pick one? Mike, he's going to, maybe he's going to hear this. Mike Stone, he's a lawyer uh, and he was in Florida at the time. He reached out to me because he's working hundred hour weeks, but he was making 200 K a year as a lawyer, but he's just not happy. And we worked together. I told him go to Birmingham, Alabama of all cities and start his Airbnb business there. And he popped up like 18 properties in a very short period of time wow. and then quit working for his law firm and he owns his own business now. <laughs> Amazing. Let's let's pull up his website and as we scroll down Sean's website, I want you to talk about the kinds of clients that you like to work with. Well, revenue management is one of the biggest ones that I've been working on now. So people who are established hosts and are suffering what we would call margin compression. So ever since COVID hit, uh, travel boomed, 
because people were stuck inside and they didn't want to be home anymore. So tra the travel boom made a very soft market, you could say. And that soft market led to more people investing, and then that became oversupply. And on the back end of oversupply, with the revenge travel scaling back down, the, the margin compression from having less customers but too many hosts, there are a lot of people going out of business in the space just because they thought it was passive income, I guess would be the best way to put it. And so revenue management is one of the most active things you can do with short-term rental to make sure you make money. And so a lot of hosts who are suffering that compression are calling me for numbers advice. Oh, I love it. Okay, he also wrote a, an amazing book called The Revenue Manager's Handbook. Let's go ahead and put that on the screen. Tell us what people learned from that book. <laughs> Again, a lot of numbers. So most people in short-term rentals have a software. There's Price Labs, Wheelhouse, softwares like that. And they plug it into their Airbnb property and then those softwares just run all of your numbers. And a lot of times people have the set it and forget it approach. But when a software fails to get you Airbnb bookings, you need to be able to diagnose how a, the software's doing or how it's not doing at right. the same time. So that book is how to, well first it's you learn all the best practices, all the lingo, all the terminology. Then you learn all the core basic techniques of pricing strategy. And then you learn how to deploy that through a software that you might already be using. So instead of just piloting that plane through autopilot, it's like the plane likes to get off course and you have to constantly course correct. And that book is how to course correct with really high level revenue management strategies. All right, we were talking just before the show about uh, failing is the key to success. Ouch. <laughs> what, do yes. you, what do you mean by that? Um, well, uh, my version, uh, I went homeless my first time trying to start a business. But I think so many entrepreneurs, we have the same thing, right? So I went to school for music, dropped out of music school. Um, that's a sad story, but my mom went to prison mm -hmm. and my brothers ended up like wards of the state and I just lost my focus, so I dropped out of school. Got into sales though, that was kind of the thing. I needed to do something that wasn't school and sales was in, I got good at it. But then that company I worked for, you know, that rebound career, they really overworked me, kind of used me. Then I went homeless because I quit working for them after kind of what I consider to be a betrayal. And I spent four months living out of a van, trying to start a business. And I eventually did succeed at one of my business attempts, which was getting back into the same industry, just now working for the same company, doing it myself. Where you get contracts with newspapers directly and you say, I'll build you a sales team, give me commissions, and I'll deploy the commissions to the sales staff. And that was my first successful one. But if I didn't go homeless, I would have never wanted to start a business, I was so loyal to that one company that just, they worked me to death and said, good job, good job, Sean, pat on the back. And I needed that validation so much that if they never betrayed me, then according to my version of that story, if they never hurt me, I would have never left and never decided to do my own thing. Sure. So that failure was that catalyzing moment for my independence and my self-reliance and then I became a business owner. Okay, so if somebody works with you, Sean, what's the process like? Uh, they contact you through the web? Uh, yeah, they'll usually find me through my YouTube channel. Uh, they'll then reach out on Instagram, talk to probably one of my team members, or they'll join my Facebook community. They'll probably have a conversation or two with me directly because they'll post their listing asking for advice. Yeah. Then they usually run into a big enough problem that they're like, I need your help on this, Sean. And then um, we jump on Zoom calls every Saturday. I do four hours of Zooms with my students wow. every week which is fun, it's my, my favorite thing to do every week. Well, <laughs> it's really fun. And you can tell just yeah. from hearing Sean that uh, the depth of his knowledge is like an ocean and, and we're just like skimming the surface right now. Uh, ADHD. <laughs> yeah. tell, tell me um, if somebody's watching this right now and they're saying, man, I, 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 I like what he's saying, uh, but I'm scared, you know, um, you, know you, you admitted that you're a salesman and I, like, uh, you make it sound so easy. Yep. Is it easy? Uh, I want to tell you yes and no, right? So if you're not an Airbnb host, right? Um, a lot of people are scared to do Airbnb because they've heard those stories in the news. Like I just said, there's what we call margin compression. There are people going out of business, but I've said in like long winded detail on some of my YouTube videos that the people going out of business are the ones who bought property to try to make it passive. And they're now waking up to the truth that it's not a real estate game. It's you, you can buy property, which is real estate, but then having an Airbnb property, whether you bought it or whether you rent it like I do, you are now operating that piece of real estate as a hospitality product. And just like the way that a barber would rent a property or like this high rise property here, you, I don't know if you guys bought the floor, but you could rent the floor of this and that's an arbitrage play. Mm -hmm. You have to make more than you rent, right. right? And you do that through media. I do it through hospitality. So to abridge this, if you're afraid to get into the Airbnb space, 
there are pros and cons to this, this time right now. There are people quitting, which means they're selling their furniture at huge, steep discounts. So you can pick up the bones of where somebody failed and buy really nice restoration hardware furniture for way too cheap. And then you can go on, on Airbnb and see which properties are still performing well, even though there's a lot of supply. And you just copy those listings. The best, the best artists steal, right? And in that way, you know, your world here is, is an analogy of your longstanding profession, right? If, you'd, if you didn't work for major media, you probably wouldn't have a podcast. Right. Same way. So I think the stat is like 85 or 86% of businesses are founded by someone who worked for another company and their company now is in direct competition or direct service to that company, wow. right? People need that overlapping Venn diagram of safety. Like I still know 60% of what I'm doing, even though it's mine now. That's really, I think, the thing. So if you're afraid of doing Airbnb, um, find out if there's a correlating strength. If you've been in the service industry, for example, being service industry is a great uh, overlap. And if you're... If you own property, owning property already is a great overlap. If you're an Airbnb host already and you're afraid, um, then yeah, you should probably watch my videos on pricing management. <laughs> That'll help you guys out. All right, final thoughts. What would you like to leave people with? Oh, it, to, to leave you guys with something? Um, I have had the most fun teaching, and I think that's what's led to my growth out of all things, right? So as a business owner, I think a lot of you can relate. I'm imagining you're a lot of business owners who watch this. There was a point where I stopped working as hard because my why disappeared, right? I was poor in Wisconsin, then I went homeless. And so my big why for making this Airbnb business was largely to not suffer from poverty-related side effects. But then at one point when I had enough money, uh, that motivation ceased, right? I, wasn't, I didn't have that killer instinct like I used to, and I had to find a new path. And so this second wave of business ownership for me has been this, like, journey of self-actualization to find out what I'm good at and then try to synthesize it and distill it into content for people who were like I was when I was 18. And so for any of you who are watching podcasts like this to try to become better business owners, if you relate to that, you don't have the fight that you used to because you're not poor anymore, there is another like flag you can wave that'll kind of like lead you towards your future. And for me, mine is finding a way to distill my success into bites that people who aren't successful yet can take away question is, is which one is yours going to be outstanding you've been an amazing guest thank you Thanks. for sharing your thank heart you very and much for me. we're going to end with his website which is his last name rocky Cheech. nailed it did i okay rocky awesome. Cheech. yeah <laughs> uh thank you so much sean thanks for coming on the show yeah thank you that's it for now we'll see you next time